<laughs> so from this passage, we're going to discuss Matt saying pastor downstairs. So we'll use this verses this morning in the scripture. So we're going to talk about the history behind this verse and what happened to Paul. And so figure out what he's talking about, you know, in the, the verses leading up to this so that we'll understand and how it relates to this passage. So we'll explain these verses too, okay? So Matt Sink is talking about more about how it can apply to our lives right now. But we're going to talk about the history and what happened beforehand. So I thought this would be good for us to learn the history behind the scripture so that we can understand. And then when we go down to watch Matt Sink preach, you know, we'll have more information about how to apply this to our lives. Okay. So I use the ESV, not the NLT, because I noticed the NLT does not have some of the words that are in the scriptures that are there. It's not the same word. The, so the translation that I use is I'd use the ESV. So I'll explain and show you where the NLT is not the same as the ESV. And there are many other Bible translations as well, but I'm using the ESV. So Ephesians 3.14, it says, For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father. So, talking about what's happening with Paul, he's feeling like he should pray for the people in Ephesus. So at that time, Paul had already preached, he'd gone around preaching, and he'd been arrested and put in jail. And it appeared that the people in Ephesus were couldn't, they were a little depressed, they were feeling down. Because at first they were excited for Paul, traveling around, preaching, they were excited about that. And then he got put in prison, and they felt a little concerned and depressed about what had happened. So in 3.13, which is just above, he said, so, I ask you all, not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory, which is your glory. So he didn't want them to be upset or worried, frustrated. He's, they wanted them to know that they could still have that relationship and closeness with God in their heart. It was all centered in your heart. And they wanted them to stay motivated no matter what happened. No matter what situation happens, continue on with your relationship. No matter, you know, if you get put in prison, it's fine. You know, there's no need to be concerned or depressed. <clears throat> he wanted the people to be excited. Even though he was put in prison. But he said no. So this is interesting. He said, I'm suffering for you all. He was willing, no matter what the cost, to be put in prison, if he was hurt, doesn't matter. He wanted them to know that he was suffering for them. So it appeared really strange and odd that he was suffering for them. That's a little strange, but really, his suffering, he was experiencing that suffering to show his faith was strong, to encourage the other people to be more strong in their faith. Because if it was not for suffering, would our faith be strong? No, it would become weak. So the suffering, when you see other Christians going through and experience suffering, we feel like we need to look up to the Lord, and our faith will become stronger. It's like in other countries, you know, in the third world countries we have out there, where there are really awful persecution of Christians, those Christians have strong faith. It's because they are continuing to look to the Lord for strength, and that grows their faith to become stronger. So if you'll notice here, he said, which is your glory, which is their glory, means he's suffering for them, that their glory, meaning what? So those people that Paul was suffering for, they felt honored. You're suffering for me? Yes. 
so continue to preach that word. Even if I'm in jail, I can still write letters and send to you. And this is what he was doing, writing letters and sending out to the people. This is for your glory. So they see Paul suffering, and they see that he continues to stand strong and true. He doesn't become discouraged. That will make them all think of the future. For when they receive, when they arrive in heaven, so if everything is all right up there in heaven, everything will be okay here as well. Everything is all right here. So those people are learning to look up, to keep their chin up to the Lord for their glory. They should be proud that they're children of God. They can continue no matter what happens, that they can remain faithful. So you understand the strength is inside. It's not outwardly. So you might become a little bit discouraged. You might feel some pain. But still, internally, you depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to help you continue and to stay faithful. It doesn't matter what the situation or what situation you're in. So you can learn from this, and they learn from Paul. So going back to verse 14. When he says, for this reason, for this reason. So the Jewish and the Gentiles, Jews and the Gentiles, they would argue, they were at odds with each other all the time about the gospel serving everyone together. So if you read these passages down, you'll see that it's talking about the Jews before when they were opposed to the Gentiles. The Jewish were very proud of themselves. They had the biblical laws, the law of Moses. The Gentiles didn't have anything relating to God. The Jews said, we have this. We're God's special people. We are the nation of Israel. And they were proud of that. And the Gentiles, but whatever, they were really opposed to the Jews because of that. But Jesus died on the cross. All that collapsed. The wall was broken. The curtain was torn. The Jews and the Gentiles were together. And that's through Jesus himself, his love for all of us. So he said, for this reason, the Jews and the Gentiles will come together. They might still have problems, but they're, they continue together. For this reason, I bow to my knees before the Father. So if you'll look in the Old Testament, the scriptures before, the people of Israel failed. They were not doing what God had commanded them. They did fail. In Isaiah 42, 6, it says, I am the Lord, and I have called you all, called the people of Israel in righteousness, and I will take you by the hand and keep you. And I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. So the people of Israel were supposed to be the light. Kind of like a lighthouse, you know. It's supposed to draw people in so that they can look to them and their God. people of Israel were supposed to call people in who were from different countries who were really you know, believe in God that was the goal it to be the influence so God was to show them and they were to show the way to God but they were too proud and they failed so now who is the light of the world There's Jesus because we failed Jesus himself was the new Israel. And he is the light of the world. We are in Christ, so we are also the light of the world. We are supposed to go and draw people in to come to Christ. We're not supposed to just go to church and then spread out so the people, you know, believers just shove them away. We're supposed to be like a lighthouse and draw others in. The same as people of Israel were supposed to, but they failed. back to verse 14 of Ephesians. And so for this reason I have to bow my knees. Well, let me ask you, sometimes we see a person you know, bowing in prayer and we think, wow, you're very spiritual. You know, it's easy for us to see and observe that. 
make them. They're very spiritual because they're bowing in prayer. But I have a question. It's very interesting. So a long time ago, most of the Jewish men would not bow in prayer. They would stand. They would shout in the middle of the streets. Right. So they would stand. You know, that was normal. It doesn't mean that they had to kneel to pray. That's not what that means. But a long time ago, at that time, people would stand and pray. And now if you'll look at the message story that Jesus had told about one of the Pharisees, and then there was another one about the tax collector, and the Pharisees would pray in front so that everybody could see I'm better than the tax collector, and the tax collector was like beating his chest, and he felt ashamed, and then he said, "Have please have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. Remember that story? They are both standing, both of them. So I'm, I took some of this out, so I, it's abbrevi- this is abbreviated. So it says, the Pharisee, standing by God himself, praying, he said, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, but the tax collector standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to the heaven, but he beat his chest, saying, God, be it merciful to me, I'm a sinner. So they were both standing, which was normal in that time. They didn't have to kneel, but some were supposed to kneel, and that was fine. Some wanted to sit, some would walk and pray, and that was fine. It doesn't matter if you're quietly standing somewhere praying, kneeling, standing, sitting, it doesn't matter, okay? Anybody have any questions? But really, you should have in your in your heart, you should be humble enough and honored to kneel to pray inside your heart. And so if you choose to kneel, that is fine. It does not mean that you have to that we must feel spiritual? No, that's not what that's for. You know, if you kneel, you can be humble, like you said. You can just feel really brokenhearted and you're grieved. You can, you feel like falling to your knees. That's fine. It's kind of like here in the Bible. It says, if you don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will help you. He will give you the words in the correct way. You'll be the mediator between you and Christ, between you and God. So sometimes you're so grieved you don't even know what to say. The Holy Spirit will help and pray for you. He will intercede for you. So it's really good just to express yourself, to be able to express yourself to God. He's not not wimpy. He's a wonderful God. He's powerful. And that's what this verse scripture shows is his power. Back to verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. So this is interesting. This is the Father. And then going to verse 15. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So in the NLT he explains this verse. <coughs> it's not the same as what this says. And so I looked at that and I started thinking, when the NLT says that God himself is the creator of everything on earth, and that's all, heaven and earth. But this is why I use the NSB version, because this is much more interesting. It says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So a long time ago, First, to be a people that were slaves, their family members, that person named them. He was then named Mur. Like, they might have given him an English name. And he was the namer. He would name this person, this person, this person. And that showed that this person had authority over these people. They were slaves. He was the one who named the slaves. And sometimes they gave them names in a different language. You'll remember Nebuchadnezzar gave different 
Nebuchadnezzar gave different names. <laughs> so God had already given these names. God has already named you from way back, from eternity. Can you imagine? From a long time ago, he's already given each of you your name. You might think, well, my parents gave me the name. Well, yes, they did. Through people, they gave you your names. But it's God has given you a name for himself. So we should feel just, wow. I mean, it's not like he's looking down. It's like, oh. You know, he looks on each individual person. You are an individual to God. Each one is important. And God has named each person. Think, wow. One thing that really touches me, and I think about, I'm like, wow. Do you know how many stars are in this sky? <laughs> billions and billions and billions and billions of stars. You can't count the stars. There's so many. It's just as many stars. They're huge. I know. I'm not, I'm not giving you a science class in here before, but the stars <coughs> are bigger than the sun. Some of them are. So that's kind of like all oh, these little spots on the screen are like examples. They're just little small spots on the earth. The stars are bigger. They're full. Bigger than the church. Bigger than the church. So God names each one. So he says, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number. So he's counted them. But all the billions and billions of stars, it's the same. He's counted. Calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Not one is missing. Not one star. Not like he forgot and he saw, oh, I didn't see that one. I missed that one. No, not one is missed. Wow. So we, there's so many, we can't count. They're so far away, we can't even see them all. But God does not miss one. It's huge. He's so much greater. We're all so small. We're tiny. But God names each one of you. We should just feel so taken back astounded it's like if you add a new and the news or Robert saw on the internet they're talking about you know the scientists there's so many planets some that they've not yet discovered and they just keep growing and growing and growing and they mess up all the time. They don't know how many. So God's power just describes that we're so small. And that just shows his love for us. We'll explain this later. God loves us so much. Wow. Verse 16 it says that, now if you remember, God is the Father, He's named everyone. It says that according to the riches of His glory, so He has everything. Everything. So just recently I went to the store with Walmart, me and my wife, and I had never thought, you know, that. Sometimes, when you go and you look for something, you find something, maybe food, whatever. Maybe it's all gone. They don't have it. The shelf is empty. And you look back in the very back, and it's all gone. They don't even have one. So you go looking around for more. That's not really happened to me very often, but I was just thinking, man, 
maybe some of you women go, oh, I don't know their sword, because they're all loud. But that's not the same way with God the Father. You say, Lord, if it's his will, he'll give it to you. You don't have to go looking for things and go, oh, I'm sorry. You have to go somewhere else and look for that. You have to go to another God, maybe he'll have one. No, God is the one. He, will he has plenty of everything. He is the abundant. And he will give. So we thank God for that. So we don't have to be afraid that we'll ask for something and know if he won't maybe not have it or not. Maybe he won't have something I need. No, if you pray, Lord, and it's his will, he will give it to you. He has everything. He's not like the president, like Trump. He's wealthy. He has millions. He's a millionaire, too. But does he have everything that we need? No. No. He can't provide spiritual needs. Only God can give you that. So we have a father, a wonderful father, who has everything we need. So we don't have to feel like, you know, we can't go ask him for anything. Go ask. If you feel like you might not have the answer, go ask. Go knock. And he will be open. The door will be open. He'll answer prayers. So I'm just wondering, you know, when we ask, he's not saying, you know, what number are you? You know, there's so millions, so many millions, but he knows. And it's not like we like to say like you have a number like you're labeled. Okay, so he says according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being. That's important. So it's your inner being. Why is that? Because that's where you have your strength from the inside. It's not outwardly. You know, we have health problems. We have many weaknesses for many things. We have to depend on, but inwardly we can continue with that strength. Jesus, we have Jesus inside, and the devil is outside. We have to depend on Jesus. So, kind of like a submarine, when you go down, it's just as smooth. When the enemies throw in bombs, it just continues to go down, and it just stays calm. Who's in control? The captain. Who's inside? He's controlling everything. It's not a panic. Nothing's in panic or turmoil. Everything is calm. And it stays in control. And it's quiet. And it's interesting that the sailors who are inside are calm as well. Sometimes if no one's talking, someone falls, but they know they hear the captain. Everything stays calm and they go forward. And it's the same as us. Inwardly, we remain calm. We have to trust in Him and pray to the Lord to help us, to give us the power of the Holy Spirit. And He will be successful. He will work through us. We don't know how. We can't explain that. It's a mystery. Same as Valerie said, when we prayed the Holy Spirit and asked for the help, we don't know how. We just trust and have that faith that He will work. And it's through His grace that He gives us the power to continue through. Amen. So, the purpose of this, you remember how we explained about how the Jews and the Gentiles were at odds with each other? You know, outwardly, symptoms, you see the outwardly symptoms. Symptoms, he's a good speller. Thank you. <laughs> so on the outwardly appearance, we have problems. But on the inside... Inwardly, we're strong, but outwardly, we always need the Holy Spirit to help. It doesn't matter. Oftentimes, we do fail. Sometimes we do, 
but we have to look back to the Father. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love. So this is interesting. You might look at this and be a little bit puzzled. You feel like, you know, Jesus maybe not dwell in you yet, but successfully, you know, as Christians, have you been saved? You've been saved through Christ receive salvation, so Jesus Christ is in you, but again, is he dwelling in you? What that means is that you continue. He continues to dwell in you, and we need to depend on the Lord, Jesus. He's inside of us, that he will continue to grow. That's all that that means. Growth in spirit. Sanctification. That we will grow in the Lord and continue in that. Christ is in you. We know that he's in us, and we can continue. So Paul was praying for them. And you remember, we cannot become perfect. We always need prayer. There's never a time when we don't need prayer. And we also have to pray for each other. Because without prayer, pray without ceasing. And we pray for each other. Pray for our brothers and sisters. This is Paul prayed. He continued to pray. We'll never reach a point where we don't need prayer. Never. We have to continue in prayer. Pray, pray, pray more. Jesus, when Jesus died and was resurrected, he prays for us now. He still prays for us. So we have to continue as well as we pray, as he prays for us. So this is very important, that Christ will dwell in you, in your hearts, through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So the point is love. Love is very (coughs) important. Love, love, love. Maybe you think, oh, I'm all right, I don't have any to complain. You might not agree with something, but that's not important. The doctrine that leads us to the truth of life that we can grow in love Jesus just as Jesus loves us we love our brothers and sisters in Christ that's the most important he died on the cross for everyone all Christians doesn't matter whether you're from a different background different church doesn't matter Jesus died for them too right sometimes I feel like we're a little at odds with another person. Maybe you don't Facebook. Sometimes you say, I don't really agree with that. Jesus died for them as well. And that's a huge change. Jesus died on the cross for them, same as he died for us. So the little things are not important. But that's a good post. So it says, you're grounded in love. And then the next verse continues. It says, may I have strength to comprehend with all, you'll notice, with all the saints. You know what that means? All the holy people. Those who are already justified. It's been announced that you're righteous. By Jesus. You've been justified. Those are the saints. All of them. Doesn't matter. Different groups. What is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? What does this mean? So that you can really grasp and understand God's love and how amazing and awesome it is. It's huge. It's big. You can't describe how deep and wide it is. When you see Jesus' love for us and how much and how huge it is that he came and sacrificed himself on the cross for us, he was willing, he humbled himself from being God to come down as a man and suffer. Wow. When we think about that and his love for us, we're taken over. It's precious. The Jews and the Gentiles, it doesn't matter what you are. In the body of Christ, we're all different. We're all freedom. We all have that freedom, freedom of being the slaves of sin. God's love can't be measured. It's just too big. 
his love and you try to measure it and say it's this big no it goes beyond that it's in, infinite what? breadth breadth so measuring in size breadth length height and depth in all directions Box. Okay. So that's the point. Is this love? The love is so important. Sometimes maybe you have a meeting with someone and you get into a little argument, a little tussle. You think you're better than them, or you're right, they're wrong. You have to put that aside. You just accept it. You might want to argue, but you have to accept it and show love. Because Jesus accepted all of us. All the persecution, he went to the cross and suffered. Same as the lamb. We have to learn sometimes to keep our mouths shut and show love and just accept it. You can't argue. Nope. Put it to the side and go through. But, Jesus knows. He's accepted everything. He's behind it. And he is the power. He could have destruct, destroyed everything, but he didn't. He chose love and he cherished his people. And so Paul was praying for them and he knew that Christ, who knows the love of Christ, that surpasses the knowledge. It's beyond what we can imagine. And you can't say, oh, I know. I know how much. No, you can't. It says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, meaning that you understand all of these things and you're... Wow. Yeah. You should be able to love others, other people, through the Holy Spirit, you see, God loves you, and you love others. And it's so important to keep your eyes on Jesus' love. Wow. And that's why I warned you, and it says, if you refuse to forgive others, the Father will not forgive you. And that means that you've not really fully understood the gospel. You have forgiveness through Jesus Christ. You have to understand that. You have to forgive others. That doesn't mean that we as Christians are truly saved may feel convicted but if you continue to refuse and you are negative towards another person and you say no they're not right they're wrong they're wrong whatever it may be that shows that you do not truly understand the forgiveness of God and when you fully understand how much he loves you you will love others so if you ask Jesus how much do you love me this much? Is this much is how much you're living? No, this much? No? Really? More? Oh. What is she just gonna do? Just keep going. As far as the east is from the west. He went to the cross. That's how much he loves you. You can't measure it. He loves us abundantly. So if you argue, complain, or negative others to make yourself look better you're missing the point you're missing the point of love you can't understand how much God loves you so we need to stop and think what is the problem is it something outwardly no that's not the true problem the problem would be deep within it's yourself have to figure out the true root of the problem inwardly and that's where you need to change it and going forward you will know how to love others and you understand God's love for us amen so sometimes you're counseling other people or giving someone else advice who's arguing trying to figure out you know it's a hard problem you need to look deeper into the heart accept it and go through it and get over it so sometimes we feel like you know a person you know whatever it is 
you know, you need to forgive them, you know, how do you feel? You feel better when you just let that go. And also, you know, you have to understand how much God loves us. And how important it is to understand that he forgives us. You can't even think. You know. He forgives me just a little. I'll love him just a little. If he forgives me a little, I'll love him a little. Maybe some people are horrible sinners. Some people sin just a little bit. Like, he owes something. Like if you owe five hundred dollars, this person owes fifty dollars. But they're both dismissed. Who does he love more? The person that owes the five hundred? You realize that you're a sinner and he loves you. That's the point. When you completely understand that Father, we thank you so much for these scriptures that show us, wow, how Paul loved and cared for and prayed for those people. Even though he was in prison and everyone was discouraged, he continued to pray. He had the power of the Holy Spirit to show them that it was right there. They had the wealth of power from you. So Lord, forgive us that sometimes we don't think about prayer or asking or coming to you and asking for our needs just don't think about it. Please forgive us for dwelling on things and arguing about ourselves, being selfish. We need to realize we are here for your glory. We're here to serve others. We're here to love each other. We thank you so much, dear Lord, for suffering for us. We thank you so much that even though we're prideful, you still forgive us. Without you, we're nothing. We have everything in you.